this has been such a wonderful, wonderful meeting. But there are some aspects that I, I dislike. It shows up all my inadequacies. All these great preachers, these wonderful messages. What am I doing even up here? Now you have to understand that I am old. <laughs> I did not realize that until my son had his 50-something birthday. And I said, dear Lord, my son is old. And a voice came to me and said, what does that make you? So I'm going to make this request today that you will help me preach or teach, or whatever I do up here. How many is willing to do that? Sometimes I forget what I'm saying. I forget where I'm at. I forget my scriptures. I've never used notes, and I hate to start. So you'll have to help me. Amen. All right? Now they tell me that a high forehead is a sign of intelligence. <laughs> and I can, uh, I can see that Brother Marlowe is getting more intelligent all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. How many of you have problems when you're reading the Bible to understand what it's saying? Anybody? Just one person? Maybe I just sit down there. I'm going to tell you why you have a problem and what to do about it, or the remedy of it. And uh, if you'll turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. Now, when the Lord began to reveal to Moses his law, he made this statement. He said, the secret things belong to the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us, that we might keep his laws and his statutes. So there are a lot of things in the Bible that are very straightforward. Easy to understand. How many of you have problem with thou shalt not steal? <coughs> Anybody have a problem understanding that? Well, a lot of people do. <laughs> thou shalt not commit adultery. That seems pretty straightforward, but a lot of people have problem understanding exactly what that means. But he revealed in his law things that are easy to understand. But there are secret things, there are mysteries in the Word of God. Now, God gave them this law, and unfortunately, they did not keep it. Always straight, going into idolatry. And you may not understand what made idolatry so attractive to the people. But there were some benefits in idolatry. If you worship Baal Peor, that means that fornication was a way of life. They even had temples built where prostitutes lived there, and when you went to worship, you just give your offering and went in, and there was provided for you flesh. That seems attractive if you're living in the flesh. Uh, Moloch, you could take your child, your baby, and throw it in the furnace because they had a statue of him, and in his, in his lap was a hole with a furnace under there, and you could just put your child in there and get all kinds of prosperity. So it had benefits. And God's people are always straying, reaching out for other benefits. 
And if we're not careful, even in the New Testament, John says, flee idolatry. And then Paul said, covetousness, which is idolatry. So if you're covetous, you're an idolater. And what's the benefit? Money. Money. You cannot serve God as mammon, which is the God of money. That's one problem I don't have is money. I got it. Or very little. But when God began to send the prophets to Israel, because they, they were always straying, and he had to reach out to them and turn them back. Always, there's always something coming up. Always they were straying, and uh, you know, that hasn't gone away. We still experience those things today. It seems like we're always sticking our neck through the fence to get the grass on the other side. Right. Hardly ever content with the way things are. So he began to talk to the people through prophets. And here in the 28th chapter, he says uh, in verse, uh, let's see, verse uh, 13. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Now listen to this. That they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. It was written in a way that caused men not to be able to understand it. It's the way it's written. It's not a, it's not a book of theology, systematic theology, where you've got uh, uh, theology proper, and then you've got soterology, and then you've got Christ Christology, and all these ecclesiology, and uh, eschatology, and all these things all lined out, where you just open the page there, look at the heading, and it has it all down there for you. It's not written that way. The reason you have a hard time understanding is the way the Bible is written. It's written in a way that you can't understand it without God. Amen. Amen. That no flesh can glory in his son. Let not the wise man say, or let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glory in, glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, righteousness, or uh, uh, loving kindness. Help me here. Judgment and righteousness. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So it's written in a way that you're left, you're left <coughs> like you are, like I am. Like we, we don't know what, what he means because it's here a little and there a little, and we don't know which, which little to put with which little. Come on, Amen. So let's go back up to verse, uh, verse 9. I'm just going to leave that open, okay? Hopefully I won't stumble around and knock it off. Here he says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Well, it's the same thing that hides, you, hides it from you, reveals it to you. The same thing. What hides the word of God from you is the same thing that reveals it to you. What does he mean? He said, them that are weaned of the milk and drawn from the breast, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, 
line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. We just have to know which little to put with which little. Amen. So let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I love this book. It's a letter, actually, that was written at the close of Paul's ministry or incarceration in, in Rome. He had been three years there and he told them, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Right. Now, Paul was not a weekend preacher. He did not have Wednesday night prayer meeting. <clears throat> he preached day and night every day. So you can imagine how much teaching they got in a three-year period. All the counsel of God. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <clears throat> preaching doesn't always... give you what you need. Now he's writing back to them. This has been some years have gone by. And he's writing to them. And this is, let me tell you, this is the deepest book in the Bible. Far beyond the book of Revelation. And the reason it is, Revelation deals with events. Easy to understand. All you got to do is figure out what the symbols are. Once you get that, it's easy. The book of Ephesians does not deal with events. It deals with ideas, with concepts. And so after three years, now he's writing back to these people in chapter 1. And he says, I'm praying for you. Now I've preached to you, I've taught you, now I'm praying for you. In verse, uh, verse uh, 15, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, you have to understand these people had the Holy Ghost. He tells us in verse, in verse uh, uh, 13, In whom ye also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. They had the Holy Ghost. But they needed a further work in God. I'm telling you today, we need a further work in God. We had the Holy Ghost. We had the Spirit of God. But God needs to do something further for us. Oh, there's things that God has. In his word, that are called the mysteries of God. And it takes a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him to understand these things. I'm asking God, yes, come move among us, Lord. Now then, I, I have this fear, as you have indicated, so that you will think that I am wise. <laughs> you see me stroking this? You say, oh, he is wise. That way, if I bomb out, which is quite possible, you will think it's you and not me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> In the book of Colossians, 
These two letters were written in close proximity about the time that Paul was being released from prison, that he had great hopes that his uh, trial had been finished, the briefs had been turned into the emperor, and he was confident that he would be released. We know that from the book of Philemon, which was written about the same time that he asked him to prepare a lodging for him. And he says much the same thing here in Colossians chapter 1. He says in verse 9, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Why? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Then he says, strengthen with might by his spirit. In one place he says, in the inner man. So in order for us to fulfill the word of God and to live like we are supposed to live and to please God in everything, we need revelation from God. Come on. Yes. Amen. 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 Back in the book of Ephesians. In chapter, uh, what, am, what am I talking about? Revelation. Revelation. Okay. What scripture am I looking for? Come on, you said you're going to help me. Uh, help them, Lord. Help them. Okay, this is one of the points that I forgot where I'm at. Uh, <laughs> Just give me a moment, okay? Uh, okay, let's forget that. Let's go on. But I don't know where to go. I, I have a thought. I have a thought. Oh, yes, got it, got it, got it. Chapter 3, chapter 3. In verse 2, and I just might mention verse 1 because it is so beautiful. For this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Notice how he's in jail. He's got a, he's got a deal on his leg, you know, a chain. But he doesn't say I'm a prisoner of Rome. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know, we have to come to the place we relate that everything that happens to our life is related to God. Amen. If you're getting, if you're in trouble, don't blame the person that's causing you trouble. Blame God. He's the one that put you there. That's a hard pill to swallow. But everything that happens in your life related to God. Amen. 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 That way, brother, if you mistreat me, I can't get mad at you. I got to talk to God. God, what did you do that for? Okay. So relate everything in your life to God because he's in perfect control. He's got a hedge around you. And if there's a hole in the hedge, he's the one that made it. Amen. If the devil gets in, he opened the hedge. And he does do that. He does that even to perfect people. A lot of people said, there ain't no perfect people. Well, Job was perfect. And he opened the hedge. Okay. Chapter 3, verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you were. And that's a point to take in mind. What God has given you is not for you. Brother Rutivi, what God has given you is not for you. He's given it for me. And I'm waiting to hear from you too, because I love to hear you preach, brother. 
I draw from these men of God. They say things I never thought of. You know, I get to thinking, man, I'm really, I'm really something. Then I come there and, and they stick a, a pin in my, in my balloon, my bowl. 